What are the proposals then in the WTO current negotiations on e-commerce that would limit developing countries and actually all countries' ability to tax profits? And I, before I go on, I just want to say the bleeding of tax resources is often looked at as a development issue for developing countries. But these corporations are stealing just as much from developed countries. And actually, in some cases, the volumes are greater because of the fact that the transactional amounts um, are greater in uh, the developed countries. So this is something that actually all countries need to look at if you're interested in funding a, a functioning state in the future. It's Global Political Economy News Docs. I'm Lynn Fries. And that opening clip was of CEPR's Center for Economic Policy and Research, Deborah James, at the World Trade Organization Geneva headquarters. Specifically, a side event organized by South Africa at the WTO's 2019 Aid for Trade Review. In featured comments by Deborah James, this show puts that opening clip into its wider context as James provides a reality check on a David and Goliath struggle going on at the WTO between the interests of big tech and its powerful developed country backers and the rest of the world. James debunks the notion that developing countries in Africa and the rest of the world should count on aid from developed countries like the U.S. to fund their own digital industrialization and narrow the digital divide. James argues tax policy is essential if developing countries are to climb the ladder to digital industrialization and that proposed e-commerce rules currently pushed at the WTO kick away that ladder. Before going to our featured clips of Deborah James at South Africa's second side event on digital industrialization, we open first with comments by South Africa's counselor to the World Trade Organization, Vahini Naidu, and Q&A with internet governance expert Richard Hill. Thank you very much for joining us today at South Africa's second side event on financing digital industrialization. On our panel today, we have Deborah James from the Center of Economic Policy Research. Deborah has immense experience and expertise in working and defending the development interests for civil society and has worked on several issues of trade and democratic governance. We are also very happy to welcome Dr. Richard Hill, the president of the Association for Proper Internet Governance and formerly of the ITU. Dr. Hill has profound expertise on issues of e-commerce, internet governance, telecoms, and ICT, and decades of experience and knowledge on the mechanics of how international organizations work. <laughs> Just to recap, at our session this morning on aid for digital transformation, we learned about the importance of having a digital industrialization strategy for countries to integrate in the digital economy. We learned today that the challenges associated with aid ineffectiveness and the reliance on donor funding, which is a cyclical instrument that several investigative reports suggest are highly problematic and detrimental to developing countries insofar as real development gains, inclusive and sustainable growth is concerned. We also learned about the skepticism associated with the connection between signing onto e-commerce rules while noting that aid has generally not been forthcoming in the ways that are needed and it should never be conditional, particularly if it requires accepting policy commitments that undermine Africa's development objectives as we define them. In view of this, there is a need to begin to explore ways in which self-financing mechanisms can be developed to address a number of constraints, from the lack of access to stable or any electricity, to access to broadband and basic infrastructural needs required for digital transformation. We have already briefly heard about innovative financing methods, such as using South-South cooperation initiatives, regional digital innovation hubs, and regional economic communities that can pool their resources together to develop, for example, an African cloud, data centers, etc. We have also heard about another way through taxes and customs duties where new business models are emerging and challenging traditional taxation and customs regimes. 
We note that taxation in the digital economy is prominent and gaining worldwide attention, with new judicial responses by some countries to introduce a digital services tax to address concerns that multinationals, especially technology companies, who are not paying their fair share of tax. France recently approved a bill that would levy 3% tax on the revenue large companies make from digital activities, such as targeted advertising, based on user data. The OECD is also in the process of finding a global solution to digital services tax by the end of 2020. I'm not sure if many of you know, but um, a, few, um, a few months ago, or really in the last two years, I would say, um, we do have within the AU structures, the African Union structures, an implementation of an AU levy where uh, it basically serves to finance Africa's peace operations within the AU establishment. And so the way this levy works is that we levy 0.2% of the value of eligible goods imported into any AU member's territory from any non-AU member. And so this revenue that is collected under the levy is then remitted in accordance with each member's approved assessed contribution and then levied in line with our international obligations, of course. And so I was just wondering, um, because this narrative on e-commerce and particularly um, a lot of research that's now coming up and the increasing discourse on the revenue implications of electronic transmissions um, in the digital space, and especially because it's becoming such a topical issue in the WTO, and where members will have to make a decision about whether we will be extending the moratorium or not, um, about whether the existing policy instruments in the WTO, such as if we did not agree to any moratorium, to any continuation of a moratorium on electronic transmissions, and the potential money collected um, from this, uh, in terms of the uh, conservative estimates already ascertained and determined by UNCTAD's paper, mm -hmm. um, could we use that money uh, to, to finance our digital transformation or put that money in some kind of fund within the AU structures or within any other developing country structure to fund our own digital industrialization? So perhaps an African cloud, data centers, a digital skills academy, or pretty much anything within the realm of digital industrialization, could that be something? I know there's other examples where um, in climate change, for example, there's a 2% levy that was agreed on the clean development mechanism, the CDM, to finance adaptation in developing countries. Are these some kinds of methods or financing mechanisms that we could be exploring to fund our own digital transformation. Um, I think it's particularly useful in the context of the WTO because of the policy space that is uh, being sought to pretty much be completely constrained um, uh, insofar as ET, digital content, etc., is concerned. Uh, Richard, please. Yeah, well, when I went to university, we had um, an expression for answering that kind of question, which you may have seen in American movies. Duh! <laughs> Meaning, well, this is so obviously yes that you don't need to say anything else. <laughs> we have heard in the WTO context that it is technically uh, not feasible to levy these kinds of duties. But I, I find it a bit ironic in the sense that we talk about AI and algorithms and um, new technology and this profound 5G and what it's going to do to the digital revolution. So why couldn't we develop an algorithm that had taxed you know, these ETs or you had found a portion of it to tax ET or the content in terms of both content and carrier mm -hmm. um, in a way that you would promote your own digital industrialization? Um, and also retain some semblance of policy space for yourself. Yeah, so the more serious answer is, of course, uh, actually getting taxes, levying taxes is always an exercise because people will either legally or Ill illegally try to avoid taxes, so it's always a bit of a cat and mouse game and you may have to change the rules. But the example I always like to use is uh, the sort of tax that nobody objects to tax on something that's negative. Let's take cigarettes as an example. So in a lot of countries, there's a tax on cigarettes. And when the cigarettes cross the border, that's when you check. There is cigarette contraband, but you know people are there at the border to try to prevent the cigarette contraband, and that's where the taxes are levied. Well, that was before they had helicopters. 
So now somebody invents the helicopter, and he says, well, guess what? I'm flying the cigarettes over the border with the helicopter. Why should I pay taxes? It's not crossing the border. <laughs> well, that's stupid, isn't it? You say, well, wait a minute. We're going to tax you when the helicopter lands, or actually, we're going to make an agreement with the other country, and we're going to tax you before the helicopter even takes off. And so that's the kind of things we need for digital. You, you need to recognize, yes, it's a different technology. So the technology for uh, capturing and levying the tax is going to be different, but you need to think about it. You know, by the way, the same people who, uh, who don't like this stuff, they're very good at proposing schemes for collecting copyright <laughs> levies, right? And there are all kinds of digital schemes for correct, co collecting copyright royalties. So let's use the same ingenuity here. I just want to say something from a U.S. perspective. The idea that your competitors are going to fund your own digital transformation for them to compete more with you doesn't actually make that much sense from the base, from the get-go. Our State Department and our USAID are very much interested in funding projects that actually aid our corporations. We're not particularly interested in helping you become competitors with us. So just keep that in mind when you think about relying on foreign aid budgets for your digital transformation. There was an IMF study which looked over 25 years to see if countries that liberalized trade and lost tariff revenue have been able to replace them. And it seemed that, yes, high-income countries were able to actually actually replace that revenue and have other sources, corporate taxes, income taxes, whatever, real estate taxes, to generate that revenue that was necessary for our own uh, development and, and national budgets. Middle income countries were able to recover 40 to 60 cents. In lower income countries, they were never able to recover more than 30 percent. Um, and in fact, for some countries, you know, they're able to recover almost none of it. So when you're talking about liberalization of trade, where are you going to get that revenue that's essential for your education, for your health budget, for your SDGs, and for funding digital industrialization, okay? So the thing that we never talk about in the WTO, and I've been coming here for, uh, well, you've been involved in WTO talks since 1999, is that the problems with global tax are significantly a result of the current trade system. The current structure of global trade that is allowing these, these corporations to take advantage of regulatory or arbitrage, of tax arbitrage, um, and therefore it's estimated that uh, about $100 billion is lost to transfer pricing and other illicit financial flows each year. Uh, that's just from Africa, okay, not talking about the rest of the developing world based on current tax and trade policies. And Sweden actually said they're giving $16.1 million over four years to the Enhanced Integration Fund, and I almost cracked up because I'm thinking $16 million over four or five years, but at the same time, the current trade structures are bleeding $100 billion from Africa. The difference in the numbers is so striking, and these are resources that were actually generated by African countries that should stay in the country for their own development so that you do not become dependent on development aid and debt financing. So these are the own resources of the people from developing countries that are being stolen, taken, Taken, mispriced, misinvoiced, some of it legal, some of it not, all of it inappropriate, that is causing the current lack of financing for domestic uh, expenditures. You know, in the OECD even, uh, which is, you know, we know the rich country club, uh, more like the neoliberal club, but they are working through this and discussions on tax reform, uh, particularly on digital policies. But then we have the situation in the WTO where the discussion is going in the opposite direction. And what do I mean by that? There uh, is a lack of discussion about the fact, and, and when we have panels like we just had on e-commerce, there's a lack of discussion about what are some of the tax provisions that are being proposed. And there's a lack of discussion about what are some of the provisions that don't look like tax measures that would have a severe constraining ability on the ability of developing countries to properly tax uh, corporate profits to fund their own development. So let's just get to the bottom of it. Not paying taxes is a core aspect of big tech, okay? So lots of companies don't like to pay tax. Richard mentioned that. Individuals, we'd all try to pay maybe the less we could legally. However, it's part of the fundamental business model of these corporations that needs to be taken on as, you know, if you're letting them into your country, it's gonna, they're going to do everything in their power, and they have tons of lawyers and economists and accountants they spend doing this to make sure that they don't have to pay tax, okay? So just as the most stark example that people are familiar with, Amazon uh, profits were $11.2 last year, and they did not 
pay taxes to the federal government in the U.S. Imagine all the other countries that they're making profits in, but they're a U.S.-based company with a lot of generated revenue in the United States, and actually they got a tax rebate of $129 million. So somehow they were able to, to make the system work in their favor that way. Um, and I'm sure that you all heard um, that there was this uh, effort to say who's going to be the second headquarters of Amazon and all these cities competed and they said we want to know what's your tax concession package we want to have a good infrastructure we want to have good education in the area we want to make sure that there's parks and recreation and good social and cultural and everything and transportation and we want to see what tax concessions you're going to give us so they want all that educated workforce you know labor on demand transportation infrastructure everything and they don't want to pay a dime for it right so this is their business model. How do they do it? Uh, this is a useful graph. I know it's a little hard to read, but it's from Fortune magazine, not exactly a leftist uh, uh, analysis here. But this just shows how Uber is able to basically book all of their profits in non-tax paying jurisdictions. Um, and how they're able to make sure that both the drivers actually providing the labor and the countries in which the value added is occurring, as well as their own headquarters of their actual office, no tax is paid in any of those jurisdictions. So they want to make sure that it's just their profits are assessed in non-tax paying jurisdictions and therefore no profit can be assessed. What are the proposals then in the WTO current negotiations on e-commerce that would limit developing countries and actually all countries' ability to tax profits? And I, before I go on, I just want to say the bleeding of tax resources is often looked at as a development issue for developing countries. But these corporations are stealing just as much from developed countries. And actually, in some cases, the volumes are greater because of the fact that the transactional amounts um, are greater in uh, the developed countries. So this is something that actually all countries need to look at if you're interested in funding a, a functioning state in the future. Of the seven uh, proposed rules that will affect tax revenue collection, um, the first one is a permanent waiver on customs duties on electronic transmissions. Let's just keep it clear here. We're talking about corporations making money in your countries, not paying taxes to the government of the country in which they're making profits. Okay, that's what tariffs are, right? So the, the losses to developing countries are 40 times the losses to developed countries. So no wonder the developed countries push this because they're losing infinitesimal amounts of money, only 3% to all developed countries from all these transactions. 97% of the revenue loss is going to you, and that means you are not being able to assess corporations making money in your country um, on the profits that they're making. This is a problem. Why should uh, e-transmissions that depend on infrastructure, they need you to have a phone system, they need you to have computer literacy, they need skills, they need infrastructure, they depend on you as a government providing that, but yet they don't want to contribute to it, and all of your national companies, by the way, will still have to contribute towards that tax base. The second one is that they're calling for a raising of something called de minimis. For those of you not familiar, de minimis is something that basically means it's too small to be able to go after, it's not worth charging. So if you have administrative costs in your customs um, administration agency, and it might cost you uh, for the course of you know, assessing taxes on an individual package, you know, $5 in terms of say the, um, the personnel and the cost and the electricity of the office and all these other kind of things, and you're only gonna get $3 in tax, it doesn't make sense for you to charge that. And so every country, based on an agreement from a long time ago in agencies outside of the WTO, were mandated to say, figure out your de minimis, it's an economic exercise that depends on your level of development, your cost of customs administration, everything else, come up with your level that's appropriate to you and then just use that. And there's an effort to come up with, uh, to raise that. The U.S.'s level is actually $800 per package. It's completely out of range with other countries and it's totally inappropriate for developing countries to even think about levels that are this high. Um, and Anna Hinojosa, who's the Director of Compliance um, at World Customs Organization, pointed out that each country is supposed to figure it out um, on themselves. Now, why is this demand in uh, the proposals, it's because the U.S. package industry wants to ship you more packages, and they don't want to have to pay taxes when they ship you small packages. So why should there be an international rule when we talk about e-commerce for development that doesn't allow you to charge taxes just so that UPS can have more business? This, you know, doesn't make that much sense. Um, 
Okay, the third one is actually that there are some proposals that countries uh, should join the Information Technology Agreement. Um, this is an agreement that on information technology related products that tariffs go down to zero. Okay, so anybody who is unfamiliar with the potential negative impacts of this on some of the products that you might be interested in uh, trading in for information technology can talk with India and see what their experience was and why they were part of the ITA1, experienced a great devastation in their information technology domestic industries, and then have therefore decided not to join the second um, expansion of ITA. But there are some countries that are asking that everybody should join the ITA as part of e-commerce for development. So another thing is to uh, ban technology transfer. Now this is just giving more uh, uh, possibilities to um, developed countries to maintain their patent monopolies, okay? So this is a big aspect to say, well, we want to be able to operate in your countries, but we don't want you to be able to use one of the most important development strategies that every developed every developed country used in its history of development, which is technology transfer. Okay, so do what we say, not what we do. And why is this important? Because the components of intangible assets, and this is largely things like intellectual property, is increasing over time in the global value add. This is why, if you look at the history of WTO, right, the percentage of world trade of developing countries excluding China is almost the same as it was in 1995. So developing countries have not necessarily gained a larger percentage of world trade. It is a sm very much smaller percentage, but they've actually lost in terms of the amount of revenues that they get from that trade. And why is it? Because corporations are booking more of their profits um, in uh, based on intellectual property, and it's a larger percentage of the profits, whereas the amount going to remuneration of workers or people who actually do the production is decreasing. The fifth proposal is that there is an effort uh, in the WTO e-commerce negotiations to have a ban on source code disclosure. Now, this is important um, because even the U.S. Um, IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, which is our tax uh, authority, um, uses source code to analyze, for example, the um, software that's used uh, by corporations in figuring out how much tax they owe. And it's really important for the agency that's making sure that there is tax compliance to be able to have access to uh, the software that these companies are using to decide how much taxes that they pay. And this would make it much more difficult to check that. Now, a big one that you've for sure heard of is that there is a proposed ban on local data storage requirements, okay? Why is this important? I heard a long time ago from the government of South Africa that they actually require all companies, foreign corporations operating in their country, to keep a local set of their financial data in country. Why? In case they go bankrupt and to be able to have some kind of adjudication of that. And it's not just developing countries. New Zealand has a requirement, for example, that all business records be stored in data centers located in New Zealand. And it's in order to comply with their tax assessment authorities' need to sometimes evaluate the data. Okay, and a big one, of course, is a ban on local presence requirements. If you are talking about digitalized firms, when there's a company actually based in the U.S. that has its headquarters in Ireland booking its intellectual property to Cayman Islands, and it's operating in your country with a third-party, uh, you know, a work labor management company that isn't in any of those above countries that is actually hiring the workers, and there's no local presence in your country of that corporation, how are you going to be able to assess the taxes that that corporation might owe the government in order to be taking advantage of all of your infrastructure that you've painstakingly built up over the decades that is providing them a way to make money? First section of things I was talking about with e-transmissions um, and de minimis, those are tariff taxes, right? They're taxes on, on cross-border trade. But the other set is about corporate profits and being able to tax corporate profits. So if you are not able to tax these corporations, and particularly digital corporations that are the engine of future growth and everything, how are you going to fund everything that you need to fund your development, which is actually far more important to your development as a country than facilitating a teeny tiny amount more um, of e-commerce in your country? And shouldn't tax policy be set according to the national interests? The other issue, though, is that these digital technologies and artificial intelligence and the things that Richard was talking about, that that disruption to your local economy are going to be very costly for you to deal with, meaning the demands on the government to respond to these situations are going to intensify at the same time, revenue is bleeding everywhere except for the U.S. and China. So how can countries invest in the digital technologies they need with no revenue base, especially when they can't get technology transfer? 
So the argument is that tax policy is essential for digital industrialization, both for protecting inf infant industries and the data that Richard talked about, as well as them for, uh, supporting them in tech transfer and in financing. We understand globally that tax reform is a top priority for developing countries. So why then is that a big effort in OECD and in the United Nations and in many other fora? But then we come to WTO and nobody's discussing the tax implications of the current proposed rules on e-commerce. They talk about it as a pitch for e-commerce for development, but this is very different from rules on the digital economy that basically are an attempt to aid corporations to keep all of your data and to not pay taxes in your countries, because that is a, a very short summary of what the uh, negotiations are. When we look at the, at the digital sphere and we see the dominance of US corporations, um, Google and Apple and Facebook and Amazon and Microsoft, there's now competitors to those institutions, but they're not coming from Europe. They're not coming from other countries that followed our model uh, in the United States. They're coming from China, and China had a different model. China did not uh, agree to uh, a ban on government regulating cross-border data transfers. China did not agree to a ban on local server requirements. They did not agree to a ban on data localization. They did not agree to a ban on technology transfer. And these are some of the key elements um, that we're going to argue are essential for digital transformation. Um, and they're sort of the opposite of what's on the table with the current uh, WTO talks. I uh, also run a network called Our World is Not for Sale, and we are the author of a letter to governments in the WTO from 315 organizations around the world, really calling on governments not to participate in uh, digital trade talks. So I want to read to you a quote, and it's really important to think about this. This is the, um, one of the lead financers of artificial intelligence, so one of the lead venture capitalists of artificial intelligence is talking about the disruption that's going to happen because of artificial intelligence and machine learning and decision making. And he's arguing that we're going to have to have a Keynesian approach where those digital corporations are going to have to be taxed heavily to then redistribute that income to all of the workers and, and, and citizens of countries in order to basically have a functioning state in the future. And he says that'll work for China and the US, but what about everybody else? And he says, I foresee only one option. Okay, this is the chief investor in AI in the world, okay? Unless they wish to plunge their people into poverty, they will be forced to negotiate with whichever country supplies most of their AI software, China or the US, to essentially become that country's economic dependent. Taking in welfare subsidies in exchange for letting the parent nation's AI company continue to profit from the dependent country's users. Hence, in the future, we are all supposed to become producers of data for these global corporate hegemons, and then we're hoping that we can get some taxes back from them in the future, and you just make a colonial arrangement. This seems like a really bad idea. Let's not do that, okay, in the future. We have to leave it there. Thank you for joining us.